Okay, good evening, good morning, whoever, uh, whatever time of day it is for us this evening right now. CW lives, and while you don't have to have uh, any CW knowledge as far as getting your general class license is concerned, we're going to talk a little bit about it because, again, some people like to get in and uh, learn CW, uh, which, in other words, is Morse code. Um so at any rate, uh, I got to do something else here. There we go. Do, 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 do. And um, get to my little chat window here so I can see what everybody's doing. Since we are doing this live and recording it. Uh, anyhow, uh, we're going to talk a little bit. It's just a short, uh, there's like 30, not too many, 30 some slides, 37 slides, 38 slides, I think. So it's not really going to be a very long um, uh, session or topic to cover in this session tonight. Okay, so when operating CW or Morse code, uh, that's kind of interchangeable, try to separate yourself from other CW transmissions by at least 150 to 500 hertz. CW is one of the most efficient ways to communicate, by the way. Uh, it's definitely a narrower signal than single sideband. If you recall, when you're using voice, it the single sideband bandwidth uh, for voice is typically... 2.8 to 3 kilohertz. And so you want to kind of stay away from the band edges at least 3 kilohertz when operating a uh, sideband. And depending on whether you're operating upper sideband or lower sideband, which end of that uh, part of the spectrum uh, that you're allowed to operate in as a general class licensee is about how far you're going to stay away from those particular ends. It's a good idea whether you're operating upper sideband or lower sideband to at least stay three kilohertz away, whether it's, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, on either end. So there you go. But at any rate, uh, with CW, you can definitely have a lot more conversations going on. QSOs is what we call them. QSOs going on in a smaller amount of space than you can with uh, voice communications. So, um, at any rate, keeping yourself separated that much. And some of the, I tell you, filtering is really good. It's great if you have a 300 hertz filter or even more narrow uh, because uh, you can filter out adjacent CW signals quite easily with a, with a nice filter. And a lot of the more modern rigs do have the capability to kind of narrow the bandwidth. Again, you can shift the IF sometimes in uh, in some radios if they have an IF shift um, or kind of a band uh, a band control to control the bandwidth on the receive side. But by keeping a nice separation, it gives your CW signal that distinct total difference from other stations. Um, when you're on 60 meters, all CW signals should be set so that the carrier frequency is the same as the center frequency, and no CW signal is allowed to move up or down off the center frequency. Uh, when a net control station asks everyone to zero beat their CW operation, it is asking you to match their frequency so that everyone's CW tone will sound about the same. Uh, there is a, a methodology where you zero beat so that um, really the net control station is going to send out, uh, he's going to key down, and you're going to zero beat your frequency so that you're pretty much right on top of him as well. And then once that's done, all the CW tones are going to be about the same because everybody's going to be tuned in about the same as well. Okay, when you're ready to try your first CW, uh, you can call CQ and you want to send at a relatively slow rate. And in reality, you want to send at a rate that you are comfortable with as far as receiving is concerned. If you send, and it's quite easy to send faster than being having the ability to receive. And 
some people get caught in that little trap. They'll get in there and go, CQ, 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 and they're sending their CW really fast. And then when somebody starts to send something back or to respond to your CQ at that same pace, you're going to have a hard time <laughs> copying because you may not be able to receive at the same time uh, that uh, particular uh, at that particular speed. So um, if you hear a station sending CQ at a very slow speed, chances are they are brand new on Morse code. So send back to them at the same uh, slower speed that uh, they're sending at. You may be very proficient. If they're a new person, if they're new to CW and they're sending slow, you want to send at a speed that is relative to them. If someone sends you an RST report of 599C, uh, it means your signal is unstable or chirping. Uh, 599 has to do with readability, signal strength, and uh, uh, let's see, what is 599? Something like that. At any rate, the C indicates that you have an unstable or chirping uh, CW signal. And it could be due to an inadequate power supply, or you may be operating from a low battery because it'll bloop, 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 it won't sound nice and clean, basically. If you're sending code to another station and they respond QRS, this means for you to please send at a slower speed. Again, that's one of those Q signals. Q signals help uh, make... Uh, your transmission shorter. Um, there, when, when you're, um, let, let's see here. Let me kind of regroup my thought here. Typically speaking, when you're sending and receiving CW and Morse code, most QSOs really relatively contain the same information. When you send a CQ or when you first establish your uh, QSO with the other station, you're going to send information and you can al almost expect this on your end as well so that you know what to listen for. You're going to send basically, uh, they already know your call sign. You're going to send your maybe your QTH. You're going to send uh, the RST report, um, which is going to be depending on what the quality of their signal is and the strength of their signal. Um, if they're very readable, five is going to be uh, the top number you're going to use if they're very readable. If they're not very readable, you're going to, of course, go down to, say, you know, four or three or something like that. Uh, nine usually indicates the signal strength on there. And nine, the other nine is the quality of the signal, basically. But uh, the Q signals are there to uh, give you uh, a shorter more efficient means to communicate in CW. So again, you're going to probably exchange your RST report, your QS or your QTH, which is your your home location or where you are at the current time. And you might send rig is, you know, and maybe send what kind of rig you have. Um, and those are all kind of the basics of the uh, of an exchange of a QSO. You may get into some other things as well and carry on a conversation about hobbies and things of that sort as well. But there's an anticipatory element to most of your CWQSOs. And as you learn to do CW, if this is something you want to do, you get to a point where you don't listen so much or try to translate individual letters. There is a specific rhythm to a lot of words and everything. Um, a specific rhythm is going to uh, be, you're going to recognize something, say, the more common cue signals, for instance. They have a specific rhythm. Uh, like also the word the has a specific rhythm and has a specific rhythm. So if you hear Da 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 dit da da dit. That's an and. If you hear the word the, it's going to sound da 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 dit dit, and that's going to become very familiar to you. So the faster you go, the more uh, important it is to actually recognize the rhythm of whole words, 
and in, even in some cases, some short common phrases. So that's how a lot of people actually work up to a faster speed is by recognizing common phrases and, and words. Cue signals are the shorthand, like I was trying to explain her earlier. I didn't know quite how to, to say that, but they're the shorthand. And they were actually developed for CW, but you're also going to hear them on voice as well. And, um, and they're still standard practice for operation. QRL is among the most common cue signal. Uh, without a question mark, it means this frequency is in use. With a question mark, it asks, is this frequency in use? So that's always a good question to ask before transmitting in any mode. Uh, again, like we covered last week in voice communications, before you actually just turn on the radio and start blurting a CQ or, or whatever out there, you want to say, is this frequency in use? And you might do that uh, two or three times. And if you hear nothing, then it's okay to start calling CQ. Same thing with CW. You send that QRL out there, and um, with a question mark, uh, someone may come back and say, yeah, frequency is in use, or they'll come out with QRL without a question mark saying, yes, the frequency is in use. Okay, QRN is another very common Q signal, and it means I am troubled by static or noise, basically. The QRN noise um is what i kind of relate that to so with a question mark it asks are you troubled by static or are you troubled by noise and there are several dozen cue signals a complete list of cue signals could be found on page 56 in your book by the way some of these are used quite often and will become very familiar with you when you work cw others are used very little you know you you're going to see uh, qth qsl qrl uh, QRN, QRM, uh, QRM uh, is uh, QR Mary, basically is interference from an adjacent channel. So the Q code QRV means that uh, you are ready with pen or computer at hand to receive the incoming message. If you're part of those CW traffic nets, the net control might ask QRV, and you can say QRV. In other words, you're ready to receive whatever message they're going to send to you. The term QSL has several meanings in ham radio. On CW and sometimes voice, it means that the other station has acknowledged your message. You may hear us even on the net uh, or just in casual conversation, even on uh, VHF voice, someone will say QSL, you know. Um, might someone might ask a question about something um it, it, you might it's very common for somebody to say qsl so qsl cards are an acknowledgement of of your communication of the qso you had it uh, covers information i don't know if uh let's see do, 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 do. i think i did this in the tech class but what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop sharing here real quick and uh, I'll show you my QSL card. There we go. There is my QSL card. And it has some information there on the front. It has my name. It has my address on it. Uh, some other information like uh, my grid square down in the lower right-hand corner. My email address. And um, let's see, what's that other one? Oh, the county that I live in. Uh, some people like to uh, collect county. Their counties are grid square collectors. And um, they get a little certificate for uh, collecting certain uh, certain counties or a certain number of counties, like worked all states. Um, if they worked all states, all 50 states, they get a little certificate. On the back of my QSL card, it has some information there. Uh, in that top line, I would uh, put in the call sign of the station I talked with. I would put in uh, the date that it happened, the time in UTC. And uh, the frequency we operated on, the, the RST signal, and uh, the mode, um, and uh, other pertinent information. Now, I don't send these directly in the mail. I do put them in an envelope and uh, send them in an envelope. That way, they don't get messed up 
while they're in the mail here. So uh, anyway, that's what a QSL card looks like. Um, I also I also have a, a smaller version, a little business card size, commonly called an eyeball QSL. And uh, I'll pass those out. Maybe some of you already have those. I think I maybe passed some out the last uh, meeting. At any rate, we'll go back to here. So if you ever receive a QSL card, um, send one back. Now, there's also uh, ways to QSL online without using a card if you don't have one. Um, you can send, um, you can do it on uh, qrz.com. You can log your contacts there. There's also Logbook of the World. Uh, a lot of uh, DX uh, and contesters use Logbook of the World. And you can look that up a little later. All right. When a station turns the communication back to you and sends KN at the end of their transmission, it means that they're wishing for only you to respond and all other stations to stand by. So you're having a QSO with someone, and you might be even in what's called a round table. There may be several people within this. And if you were if you had just sent something to someone in Morse code, and they respond back to you with the KN, they mean they're directing it directly to you and nobody, nobody else in the, uh, in the group. The end of a CW formal message usually includes AR. This lets all operators know that the formal message has been sent completely, and you can see a list of common CW abbreviations on page 233 of the appendix. Okay, that new, brand new radio you rewarded yourself with in preparation for successfully passing the general class uh, license exam will likely have a built-in electronic key, or most modern rigs do. Um, you could set the keyer to accept your granddad's old J38 straight key, but why not try your CW skills with paddles where your thumb and finger create strings of dits and daws with a single touch? And I happen to have right here in front of me uh, my keys. I have the paddles here. I just plug that right into my rig and using the paddles, one side is dit, uh, dits and the other side is daws. Um, yeah, we call them dits and daws, not dots and dashes. And if I, I can set my radio to straight key if I want, where I have to actually form the dits and daws uh, myself. So that kind of bypasses the internal keyer. This actually, uh, using the paddles, actually activates the internal keyer in your radio. So that's, that's one thing. Now, when you get fast enough, <laughs> let me tell you, I have here a Vibroplex uh, bug is what they call this. This is quite the unique uh, little um, uh, little um, telegraph key uh, because it's on a spring and it has a spring right here. I'll show you a little bit of a close up. And um, it takes a little getting used to operating this because it's really designed for people who can transmit and receive CW rather quickly. And if you can't do it quickly, the bug is not for you. <laughs> it's, uh, I inherited that. I like it. I'm going to keep it. And uh, it's not for sale. <laughs> okay. So we're back here uh, again. Um, again, most modern uh, radios have a built-in here. Now you can also uh, get a program if you if you're trying to practice CW. There's a program called CW Get and uh, CW Transmit, and it hooks up to your radio uh, through your computer basically, and you can receive. It'll translate all those right on the screen and everything, 
and it'll help you kind of work up a little bit uh, your speed in CW. And I have one of those as well. Um, I try to listen and just use my own intellect and, and mental capacity to, uh, to decode the CW signals. But when I'm not sure about something, I can easily look at the screen and say, oh, yeah, that's right. So there are programs available, little applications you can use on your computer to help you with your CW skills. So if you decide to do this, you'll begin your adventures with CW transmissions using Vox mode to turn on the transmitter when you start keying and turn it off a few seconds after stop keying. There are settings on your HF rig, uh, particularly the Vox. There is a manual way to do it. You can actually do uh, um, a, a little switch. And when you're ready to send, you just turn that switch on and that automatically primes the transmitter. And with that activated, when you start sending your CW, it uh, actually powers on the, uh, the transmitter in, in full mode uh, to send your CW signal. So, but the Vox mode gives you semi break in capability. And what that means is that you can respond immediately, or uh, let's put it this way while you're listening to a QSO and your radio is set to Vox, you can break in quickly if you, if you need to just get somebody's attention. So in the last line, the last sentence there, if another station wishes to interrupt, you will hear it signal between your dots and dashes. That's semi break in or uh, actually a full break in mode. Beacon stations are important for the study of propagation and reception from the ionosphere. Always try to stay clear of beacon stations. There are uh, lists of certain beacon stations on certain frequencies and it gives you kind of an idea of what the propagation is like uh, for any particular given day or time of day. So beacon stations are generally found at uh, 14.1 megahertz, and you'll also hear them between 28.2 and 28.3 megahertz, which is in the CW portion of the 10 meter band, and the 14.1 is in the CW portion of the 20 meter band. And up on two meter band, um, you'll hear uh, 144 below 144.3 megahertz uh, is uh, you'll hear maybe beacon stations as well. They're one way transmissions since six meter beacons are great for determining a band opening. Six meters is that magic band. And I, I haven't really been able to take advantage of six meters like I'd like to. Generally speaking, when I find out there's been a six meter opening, it's over with. Um, so at any rate, uh, uh, if you listen in, if you tune around, if you're really curious and interested, uh, you might tune around in a particular band around where those beacon stations are supposed to be transmitting. And if you listen to them and uh, if you can get their call sign, you can kind of get a pretty good idea of probably approximately where they are. So on this, uh, this is a chart that uh, shows a list of some of the beacon stations that you might hear on some particular the uh, some of the particular frequencies these aren't the only ones there are people uh, some hams will actually establish their own uh, beacon station and um, have it running other than what you see listed here and if you look down at the bottom it kind of gives you an idea of what that beacon uh, signal might consist of Again, beacon stations are used for propagation surveys and uh, must never transmit more than 100, 100 watts peak envelope power or PAP output. They do not run the full 1500 watts. Beacon stations are important for the study of propagation. So do not, again, this is just a rehash of the previous one here. Ham radio ham operators are permitted to put up only a single beacon signal in the same band from a single location.
Okay, it is encouraged to learn Morse code. So in the back of the book is a complete chapter on learning the code. On-air code practice is a great way to boost your copying speed. Sometimes uh, when receiving a weak CW signal, you hear interference too. You can try this trick, switch between upper and lower sideband to see if one of the sideband filters pulls in the CW signal better and reduces the interference from other signals. So yeah, you can hear CW in single sideband mode. It's usually best though to have your rig in CW if you're going to listen to it and, and uh, communicate with CW, have your radio in CW mode uh, because it is more narrow and it actually filters out on the receive side uh, a lot better than a single sideband mode does. <clears throat> okay, when you switch modes on your new radio, appropriate filters will fall into place, giving you the best signal to noise ratio, and you might be able to select tighter CW bandwidths, and this will further improve signal to noise ratios. Um, I have that video somewhere. If you have a chance, look up this because it is just incredible. This was a little competition between these two guys sending CW versus two of these young millennials using um, texting on their little cell phones or their little smartphones. And it was quite interesting. So um, if you get a chance, look that up on YouTube. All right. Now we're going to get into the question and answers. Cohen, you're the only one on here right now. Mitch apparently had something to do. So um, that's okay. We're going to continue doing this. And even if you had to drop off, I'd probably continue doing it anyway to get it recorded. When selecting a CW transmitting frequency, what minimum separation should be used to minimize interference to stations on adjacent frequencies? That's pretty easy because uh, remember we said uh, 300 hertz is, is about median for a CW signal. They can be actually be more narrow than that. But if you answer B, 150 to 500 hertz is a good separation between stations when operating CW. So what does the term zero beat mean in CW operation? Again, this has to do with the net control operator. He says, hey, zero beat uh, your signal. And what you're actually doing is that you're matching your transmit frequency to the frequency of a received signal. I wish I had this more live and I could demonstrate that a little better, but that's all right. What is the best speed to use answering a CQ in Morse code? All right. Again, <laughs> what I said before, you actually want to send and receive at the speed. If, if you received it as, at, at a particular speed, you send at a particular speed. If you want to receive at a particular speed, you want to send at that speed. So the speed at which the CQ was sent is appropriate. When sending CW, what does a C mean when added to the RST report? That was very easy. The C actually uh, corresponds to a chirpy or unstable signal. A is correct. So what should you do if a CW station sends QRS? Again, remember what that S might mean, because if you're sending too fast, they're going to say QRS or send slower. All right. What does the Q signal QRL mean? Okay, again, um, like we do in voice, you want to make sure before you send anything out on the frequency, you want to make sure that the frequency is not being used. You may only hear one side of the conversation going on. And you, if you tune into a frequency where there's a QSO going on, and it may be at a point where the station that's, currently talking, you can't hear, but the other station you might be able to hear. So you want to make sure that 
you ask as a courtesy, is this frequency in use or is this frequency busy? So what does the Q signal QRN mean? Again, uh, they use the word static here. I use the word noise. So if you just kind of equate that noise and static, B is the correct answer, yes. So what does the Q signal QRV mean? Uh, okay, um, QRV, again, if you're in a net control situation where you're receiving and transmitting messages, uh, say radiograms, the QRV if with a question mark mean, from the net control may mean, um, are you ready to receive messages? And you respond with QRV saying, yes, I am ready to receive messages. Okay, what does the Q signal QSL mean? Uh, predominantly, QSL means uh, I have acknowledged receipt of our QSO or of your transmission. So what does it mean when a CW operator sends KN at the end of the transmission? Again, they're, uh, with this one, they're not listening for novice stations. They're not operating. It doesn't mean anything about full break-in or closing the station down, but they're only listening for a reply from a specific station. C is the correct answer, yes. So the pro sign sent to indicate the end of a formal message when using CW. You've already sent your message, you, you've passed it along, and you're all done, basically. Uh, your appropriate response is A, R, or the answer is C. What is the purpose of, electronic, of an electronic keyer? Uh, the electronic keyer does an automatic generation of strings of dots and dashes or dits and daws, as we like to call them, because that more closely approximates the sound that you're hearing. And that's why we refer to it as dits and daws. Did it, did it, da, 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 da. So, uh, but there you're saying dots and dashes for CW operation here. So which of the following describes full break-in telegraphy uh, or QSK is what they call it here. So you wanna be able to hear between code characters and elements um, of your transmission. So for, by using full break-in, if somebody wants to interrupt or let's say they have an emergency and they wanna break in, you're able to hear that signal uh, in between your, do, uh, your characters, your dits and daws and other elements of your message. So that's what full break-in telegraphy is. Which of the following is a purpose of a beacon station as identified in the FCC rules? Uh, they have nothing to do with net frequencies, but it has to do with being able to identify pr propagation for a given time of day or frequency, uh, things of that sort. So observation of propagation and reception is the purpose of beacon stations. So what is the power limit for beacon stations? Again, they're not allowed to run 1500 uh, watts, but the maximum power is 100 watts. With which of the following conditions must beacon stations comply? Uh, there are certain conditions that have to be um, met as far as beacon stations are concerned. And you're limited to the number of beacon stations you can use. So there must be no more than one beacon signal transmitting in the same band from the same location. So in other words, if you put a beacon station on, uh, you can't, uh, let's say uh, 10 meters, for instance, and you put your beacon station on 28 to 10 or something of that sort, uh, that is the only one you can put on the air. It makes no sense anyway to say, put another beacon station on 28 to 20 uh, because you're in the same area, this propagation is going to be the same on 220 as it is on 210. So, but you're not really allowed to put more than one station anyway. 
What is one advantage of selecting the opposite of reverse sideband when receiving CW signals on a typical HF transceiver? So there is an advantage of selecting the opposite or reverse sideband when receiving CW. And uh, it may be that you um, have some interference or uh, some other uh, uh, something that's interfering with you. So it may be possible to reduce or eliminate interference from other signals. That is the advantage of selecting the opposite or reverse sideband instead of being on CW. So why is it a good match? Uh, why is it good to match receiver bandwidth to the bandwidth of the operating mode? Your single sideband signals are wider your cw signals are more narrow so really you're looking for the best uh, signal to noise ratio when it comes to um, when it comes to operating different modes in your uh in your quest that is the end of that particular part so if you have any questions I'm here to answer them because next we're getting into digital and there's 90 some slides for that. So it's going to take up probably the rest of the uh, session tonight and hopefully we can get through it rather quickly. Do, 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 topic six, topic seven. There it is. I'm good to go. If you uh, if you want to go on with that, it's fine. All righty, we'll get right going. Oh, Mitch is here. I thought you left, Mitch. I couldn't. I didn't see it first. <clears throat> I'm waiting for the PowerPoint slide to come up. <laughs> so morse code is can be fun uh don't take it <laughs> i see you mitch um and like i say you don't have to know it but it, it's good to know anyway nonetheless while I'm here, I'm just going to show my uh, digital radio here real quick. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn it on. And you're going to see that it's going to boot up uh, with my name and call sign on it. It takes a little while. And uh, this operates dual band. I have an analog frequencies up here in the top portion. Down here is the digital repeater, the local digital repeater. And um, this is an Alinko um, model DJMD5. Sounds like a rap group to me. And now DJMD5. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, it's been quite interesting on digital um, because... The way digital uh, is operating, it um, actually relies on the internet more than anything. I don't know how that's going to function in a disaster situation, but you can go direct with digital communications. But what's interesting about it is, uh, as far as DMR is concerned, is that you hear stations from all over the place. Uh, quite uh, regularly, you hear stations uh, on here from New Jersey and New York and Texas and California and even over the overseas. So it is a way to communicate overseas. It's not like HF, of course. Um, but the one thing about digital is you're either there or you're not. There's no middle of the road. There's no fading. It either cuts out from lack of signal uh, or it comes in from having adequate signal. So digital is a rather interesting 
um, mode to operate. I'm going to go ahead and turn on worldwide here, and we might hear something from across the pond. All right, my digital slideshow is up and running. I have to get my... stuff all right squared away and then i can share the screen again and here we go all right digital operations let's get going on it here Okay, digital modes are found grouped together on each of the ham bands, skillfully placed so they do not cause interference to nearby CW operators. 14.070 is a very popular, and that's on 20 meters, is a very popular uh, frequency in which to operate digital modes. And they can be not just this little portal, this is DMR or something totally different. Because on HF, you're going to operate, you know, PSK, RTTY, you know, or any variety of uh, digital modes that are available out there these days. Uh, best to have a little, um, to, to operate digital modes, you're going to want to be able to connect your computer to your HF rig in order to do the operating. Um, give me just a moment. And I'll be right back. There are different ways to connect up your, your radio for digital operation to your computer. And uh, one of them is this little gem right here. This is uh, from Tiger Electronics Signal Link USB interface. I'm sorry about the um, non clarity of, uh, of this, uh, but you can see there's a few controls there. On the back, excuse me, that's the DMR radio portable. I don't know who it is. Came in pretty loud though. But on the back, you see there's a USB connection here. Um, to go to the computer. And then you have a couple other connections. This typically goes to the radio. And what you will what you would do is, if it's a newer rig that has a connection for digital communications, uh, if you order this, you want to order the cable set as well uh, for your particular radio. I have, uh, my particular radio is... Um, an ICOM 706, and that's what I use for digital communications. But uh, Tigertronics is the uh, place to get this. This is about, I'm trying to think. I paid about 160, I think, for this. I'm not real sure. Um, stand by, I'm gonna mute. Of course, I can't get anybody to answer the phone. <laughs> I have to do it. All right. At any rate, after that little show and tell, we'll get back to uh, sharing our screen here. So, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned before that 14070 um, is uh, where you'll find a lot of it, but it also extends to 14.1. So there's a 30 kilohertz digital window, and there's a waterfall. Uh, what they call a waterfall when you bring up your digital operating application or software on your computer you can see where uh, there are digital communications going on and uh, i use um did you see i can't remember the name of my software that i use um sorry about that but uh 
it can be quite interesting. And you just have to make sure that you have your decoder set to the proper uh, decoding method for uh, the digital mode that's being used. So on the 80 meter band, tune from 3570 to 3600 kilohertz for some data signals as well. Um, so make sure that your computer is equipped with the proper program to do that. Something kind of interesting back here. Use lower sideband and a digital decoder. Yeah, you know, that's another thing too. Um, All right, I'm back. Uh, instead of using upper sideband, which is used for voice on 20 meters, of course, uh, you'll use lower sideband for uh, digital communications. My apologies for the interruptions here. <sighs> Don't expect, I need to turn my phone off, I think. On the 80 meter band, um, again, tune from 3570 to 3600 for uh, data signals. Again, this is down part of that uh, CW and digital part of the band. <clears throat> Give me five. This is a good way to remember BAUDIT or BAUDOT is a five bit code with an additional start and stop bit. And if you look in your book here, I need to look at the, uh, the actual question to actually get the full meaning of that particular uh, question. The slides, I should be on the, in the book anyway. The sides don't always give me everything that I need uh, to. Uh... So, okay, the question on this is, which of the following describes BAW dot code? And it's a five bit code with additional start and stop bits. That's what that little slide is referring to. Every once in a while, a slide will pop up that is a little cryptic for me. And if I'm not looking at the book, I don't know what it actually is talking about. So almost all ham radio ready or RTTY transmissions uh, use 170 hertz shift. Uh, commercial broadcast stations on shortwave use larger frequency shifts. While FSK signals could reasonably be called high and low because of their relative frequencies, there is a specific logical significance to mark and space. Uh, this is true whether you're operating on a closed loop landline, as many RTTY or RIDI, it's commonly called RIDI, uh, as many RIDI circuits once were, or over the air. I know that when I worked at the phone company, we had a teletype, uh, which was RIDI, and uh, it was a dedicated line uh, that was used uh, between different uh, offices, uh, phone offices for particular purposes. Uh, but there are some that uh, actually operate over the airwaves. So at any rate, um, In order to separate frequencies of an FSK signal, you use mark and space, and which is define the actual one and zero logic states of a two-state digital system. If you plan to operate radio teletype using audio frequency shift keying or AFSK, your single sideband transmitter must be switched to lower sideband or LSB. Uh, a friend of mine back uh, back in the day, uh, that's all he did. He operated RIDI. He had a teletype machine in his shack, and that's what he operated mostly as far as HF was concerned. And uh, it sends an audio signal. It doesn't doesn't really uh, it keys the radio, uh, but it doesn't uh, operate the same as uh, say a CW signal does, uh, but it does send the information audibly. So that's why it's important to use a sideband 
uh, mode of operation, and in this case, lower sideband. Boy, I tell you, that thing clacked and clacked and clacked. They are noisy. So frequency shift keying is used by a number of digital modes. Um, the oldest of which is RIDI or radio teletype. Uh, the computer sound card is the most convenient, convenient way to try out a number of FSK modes. Uh, so this applies, so this allows you to apply the audio directly into the microphone input of a single sideband transmitter with little or no modification. So it actually uses uh, audio frequency shift keying more than it does actually shift the frequency. Uh, that is then converted to true FSK in a properly aligned single sideband transmitter. Uh, let's see, this is 14, okay. Reversing the mark and space audio tones has exactly the same effect as having the single sideband transmitter on the wrong sideband. So although some software is capable of detecting reverse tones, not all sound card programs are that smart. So if you encounter difficulty, keep this in mind. Uh, if you're not on the right, I mean, you could be on the lower sideband, you could be doing everything right, everything adjusted, but you're still not receiving it. Uh, reversing the mark in space, there is a capability within the program to do that, that would allow you to actually receive the signal you're trying to pick up. So again, if you're encountering difficulty decoding an FSK signal of any kind, try reversing the sideband or the audio tones. Also be sure, be sure you're set for the right baud rate. So RTTY standard is 45 baud, but other digital modes do have multiple available transmission baud rates. So that's something you're just gonna have to kind of play around with to learn. And if you, if you have the CD, I do believe the CD has the different signals of what different digital signals actually sound like so that you can identify whether it's an RTTY or an FT8 or something of that sort. So there are some distinct sounds that help you identify how you should set your receiver and your program and everything to decode the digital signal. There are a number of stream, extremely weak signal modes that uh, were developed by Nobel laureate and radio amateur Joe Taylor, K1JT. And that's where we get the JT uh, protocols from. Uh, let's see. Let me get uh, over here at the right page here so I know what I'm talking about. Um, the JT protocols... Uh, they have some very unique operating methods. They're not uh, they're not fast communication modes, but they work when nothing else will. The JT65 format was developed especially for moon bounce and radically reduced the equipment requirements for radio amateurs interested in working this mode. Uh, JT9 was specifically adapted to low band HF operation. So they are kind of slow modes to use. And the question being, which of the following digital modes is designed to operate at extremely low signal strength on the HF bands? That would be JT9 and JT65. All right. There are a number of conventions that dictate amateur radio standard usage when there are no specific FCC rules that apply. So such conventions generally come about for a good reason, and unless there's a compelling reason to depart from it, it's best to follow con convention. So since the advent of sound card digital modes, it is conventional to use upper sideband uh, for HF digital operation regardless of the band. And I know that they said lower sideband uh, before. So this is one of those confusing issues that, you're just going to have to tuck away in the back of your head. Um, they do say use upper sideband in this instance and lower sideband in the other. Um, 
and I don't know why they've confused the issue here with this. Uh, upper side band, uh, you know, I was always uh, kind of thought that when it comes to digital modes, you use lower sideband, and here they're talking about upper sideband. So I don't know if this is a mistake or not, but for the purposes of this particular course, uh, your proper answer to this is going to be B or upper sideband. PSK31 was one of the first popular sound card digital modes, uh, followed quickly by countless other sound card digital modes. So there's no elaborate setup or interface connections uh, as far as the sound card modes are concerned, which is why they're so popular. Um, you can receive, you just won't be able to transmit, you can receive without the little interface that I showed you here, simply by taking the output of your radio and plugging it into the microphone or line input of your computer. And uh, there should be options there to allow you to hear the signal while you're receiving it. Just make sure you don't overdrive the line input or the mic input from the speaker output of your radio. Again, the best place to start is 14.070 megahertz, or yeah, 14.070 megahertz. That's a mistake there. That should be megahertz. And be sure it's set to upper sideband. The sounds of PSK31 take on the characteristics of a steady whistle with just a little warble in the airwaves. It's that variable warble that is part of very code characters represented by a variable length combination of bits. And just like the name Vericode implies, the number of data bits varies. More information on digital activities can be found in ARRL's HF Digital Handbook. I don't have a digital handbook, but I do have uh, the big, humongous uh, handbook that they put out, which includes digital modes as well as a plethora of other information in it. So when RTTY was king of the digital modes, only capital letters were available. So to the uninitiated, plain ready looks like you're always yelling. PSK31 has the entire character set available, but with a price. So if you try yelling in PSK31, you slow down considerably because capital letters have longer codes. So use caps when you need to, but not all the time. So you'll see a lot of the transmissions in PSK31 to be lowercase letters. Whereas in RIDI, you're going to see all capitals. Moving along with PSK31, it's noted for being a very narrow band mode. So on your waterfall display, a proper PSK31 signal will appear as a single thin line. I don't know if they have a picture of the waterfall display in here or not. I didn't see one. Um, do, 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 Yeah, I don't see one. But I don't know if you, uh, if any of you have ever seen the waterfall display or not. I can, let's see. Do, 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 um, here we go. I'm going to pull this over here. That's what a waterfall display looks like. And these are all digital signals in there. And this happens to be on the 40 meter band. And you can see these digital signals kind of stretch from the lower end, uh, the bottom end of uh, the 40 meter band up to around 7.040. So, and you can almost tell which is which. Um, 
like this might be PSK 31 here. This might be some other mode. Uh, not sure what it would be. Maybe RTTY or something of that sort. But that's what a, a, a waterfall display would look like on your computer. Um, do, 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 do. <clears throat> Uh, the appearance of multiple lines is a good indication of intermodulation distortion, generally re generally resulting from overmodulation of the transmitter. You really don't want to have the audio turned up too high when it comes to digital modes, and you really don't have to run a whole lot of power either. Um, so you may want to avoid the the overmodulation by turning back your uh, transmitter power, turning back the uh, the drive on your audio, and uh, that way it would give you, uh, you should be able to see a little bit on your display that you are sending correctly. So you just want to have just enough audio to achieve between 25 and 50 percent of the available peak uh, envelope power that your transmitter can provide. PSK31 is a weak signal mode, but you will be surprised just how little power is needed for effective communications. Um, uh, this uh, HF offers more interesting modes than you can shake a keyboard at. And uh, there you can see a little bit of a waterfall display. This is uh, a little add-on to this particular radio. This is an Elecraft uh, transmitter. Elecraft seems to have come out with some very interesting uh, uh, features as far as radio is concerned in being able to operate digital modes directly. A waterfall display is a special type of spectral display. It shows the demodulated audio frequency of a radio signal using one of the many sound card digital modes and unlike a standard display of a spectrum analyzer or pan adapter the waterfall display has memory it will show a record of radio events over a significant period of time the standard waterfall display shows frequency along the horizontal axis intensity by means of color and time by vertical scrolling and when you watch it it actually scrolls so it can show you a lot of information about what's happening on the band. Phase, oh, good. Kevin showed, uh, showed you, or, that's great, wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. So you're a little bit more familiar with it then. <clears throat> well, actually, um, that's not quite true. Uh, he shared us a, a different graph, but it wasn't, it wasn't what that was. Oh, okay. I meant to, I was going to correct that, but I didn't. I didn't have a chance where you were going. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, phase shift keying or PSK sounds like a steady carrier with a little superimposed warble on 14.70 megahertz. PSK 31 occupies only about 31 hertz of bandwidth. That's why it's PSK31. So with an approximate transmitted symbol rate of 31. Baud is the symbol or bit rate. In RIDI, each character takes five bits, so the character rate is one-fifth of the baud rate. In PSK31, the symbols are different lengths, so the baud rate is an average. Capital letters have more symbols per character, and so are slower to transmit. There are some excellent software programs to decode PSK31 and many that you can download for free. DigiPan is the name of the digital program that I use. Um, there's another one called FL Digi that you can also download. That seems to be a popular one. I've never been able to really configure FL Digi very well, but I can do DigiPan very good. <laughs> P 
PSK31 is actually a rather unusual code. It opti is optimized for very narrow bandwidths. PSK31 uses a code known as VeriCode for its different symbol lengths. So while the method of using a single sideband transmitter to convert an AFSK signal to an FSK signal is pretty much universal. And there is something to be said for generating FSK the old direct way. And one advantage of old school FSK is that it allows you to use very powerful and efficient class C RF amplifiers. <laughs> this method is, method is still in common use by serious RIDI contesters and DXers. So the most direct way of creating FSK is to shift the frequency of an oscillator by keying in a small amount of capacitance across its resonant tuned circuit. If the oscillator is low powered solid state circuit, it can be keyed directly with a digital gate chip. So you're doing something totally different than actually using your computer um, with the audio frequency shift keying method. Again, here's a little uh, a picture of the signal link that I just showed you. And it just plugs in between your transceiver and computer and allows you to use your keyboard to key your transmitter with a minimum of muss and fuss. So you know why big boats go so slow out of the harbor? If they went any faster, they would create big wakes that would upset every other boat on the other side of them. So, same thing for ham radio digital modes. If you're going to send fast, you'll need to go to higher bands that will permit the faster sending speed and wider bandwidth. So you need to go to the higher bands that will permit that faster sending speed and wider bandwidth. Okay. Ready and data emissions below 28 megahertz or the 10 meter band must creep along no faster than 300 baud. The slow symbol rate is required to minimize bandwidth allocation on the very crowded high frequency bands. Yeah, you'll notice that um, 10 meters has quite a bit of space to it. It goes from 28 up to 29.7. So you have 1.7 megahertz of band to play with there. Um, as far as what modes uh, of all the different modes that are available, the upper end of 20 of uh, 10 meter band is generally generally reserved for uh, FM um, simplex and FM uh, repeater modes. So data emissions on the 20 meter band must creep along no faster than 300 baud. This slow symbol rate is required to minimize bandwidth usage. Again, it's just another way of what they just said in the previous one. So on 10 meters, you, you know, we're permitted to increase RIDI and data emission transmission speeds up to 1200 baud. This is four times increase from the slower speed required on frequencies below the 10 meter band. The next possible answer up from 1200 baud is 19.6 kilobauds, and kilo means 1000. So 19,600 baud is real quick for two meters. Remember the faster rates are permitted on higher frequencies more, where more bandwidth is available for the signal. I don't think you'll really hear too much of that on two meters. You'll probably uh, get more of it on say the 220 band or the 440 band but it's not unusual uh, necessarily to not hear it on two meters okay you can open up the throttle up to 56 baud when we transmit on one and a quarter meters or the 220 band and 70 centimeters or the 440 megahertz band you'll find some exciting data, data links on these bands on this chart you'll see that the maximum baud rate for the amateur bands, uh, 160 to 12 meters is 300, 10 meters is 1200, 6 and 2 is 19.6, 5 and 
And going up from there is 56 and nothing specified above those other two bands. So within the header are routing addresses and handling information for digipeters that direct your packet over a specific route, even coast to coast and worldwide. If you're into APRS or automatic position packet reporting system, you can set up your packet header for local or wide area relay of your position report. Okay, on the next question, Echo Link and IRLP are two very popular internet to amateur radio technologies. The radio transmitter and receiver or repeater involved in the system is known as an automatically controlled digital station. In this case, there's actually two control operators responsible for the legal operation. The distant internet, or internet computer operator as well as the amateur who communicates to the RF side of the link. So if you're on Echo Link, and I can bring up Echo Link here on my computer, I can access a repeater somewhere else in the world and talk to somebody over there. Both of us are equally responsible for the legal operation uh, of that QSO. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bring up my Echo Link uh, application here on my computer uh, and show you a little bit about it. I know you can't see, uh, see this too well because it's not very big print. But in Echo Link, um, you have different locations. You have locations in Africa. Uh, the Asian continent, the European continent, continent, North America, Oceania, and South America. And you have different node types. If you just want to connect, you just want to find users, you can click on that. And these are all the users that are currently connected on Echolink. And uh, if, you, if I scroll down here, let me do this a little faster here. I can see myself as being connected on there. So I show up in this list with a lot of people uh, as well. Right now, there are 963 users connected on Echo Link in some form or another. Some people will show about where they are or what maybe uh, what they're using. This person right here in 3JMN is using a Samsung smartphone, it looks like. Yeah, you can get an app for that. If you want to know repeaters, okay, uh, you can look those up as well. <laughs> and um, uh, like you want to talk to somebody in Pittman, New Jersey or Clay, New York or whatever. Uh, you can see where those repeaters are located. And the R designation indicates that it is a repeater. If it has an L designation, it's a link. Somebody has set up in their home a link, an echo link link to a repeater. So that is that there. Uh, you can set up alarms if you're looking for particular people to check in. Uh, you can set up an alarm with their call sign, and if they check in, you'll get a notification. You can enlist also favorites. Uh, the echo test, uh, I don't know if the echo, echo test thing is working or not. It depends on whether this IP address is set. It doesn't sound like it's set in my uh, router right now, so I'm not connecting to echo test apparently. But you can, when you connect up to Echo Test, you can talk into it and it'll send back what you sound like and it get, lets you know whether you're working or not. So, Echo Test, I'm not connecting because apparently uh, the router needs to be set up with my IP address in order for me to, uh, to get online for that. And I'd have to do that a little later. But that's, what echo link looks like 
<clears throat> in recent years, there have been major changes in the rules pertaining to automatically controlled HF stations. Uh, there is a potential that exists for severe um, interference from automatically controlled HF stations. And you must be extremely careful to follow the rules, which include performing this function only in the specified HF band segments. The one and a quarter meter or shorter wavelengths and in specific segments of the 80 meter through two meter bands um, uh, are of particular interest. And although it's not spelled out in the FCC rules, an automatically controlled remote HF relay station absolutely must have an effective listen before talking protocol implemented to avoid transmitting on top of an existing station. All radio uh, amateur communications must be made by a control operator of some sort. Uh, and you can, you know, sometimes it can be a little tricky determining the identity of the control operator. So in the case of Echolink or IRLP, the control operator may be located clear across the country from an actual transmitter. IRLP stands for Internet Radio Linking Project. And that's kind of what DMR uh, is writing on the back of at this current time. I think IRLP is pretty cool. The first encounter I had was a UHF repeater in uh, Kitchener, Ontario. They have a UHF repeater up there, and I was listening to it one day, and I mean, I was hearing people from around the world and quickly discovered that it was an IRLP repeater. So uh, you got to be very cautious. If you bring up a distant repeater from your Echolink computer, you are able to control, you are the control operator responsible for what goes out over the air. So when you bring up that repeater, you're just like you've picked up your, the microphone on your radio in your vehicle or your ham shack or the portable radio or whatever. It's the same thing. If you're on a repeater, you need to identify just as if you were using a radio. <clears throat> Again, third-party traffic rules have remained essentially unchanged throughout the history of amateur radio and are unlikely to be changed significantly in the foreseeable future. You must not perform any third-party traffic handling with any entity that does not have a third-party agreement. No exceptions. We covered that before. All right. Uh, two devices in your new general class station that could be connected using a USB interface are your computer and that brand new high frequency transceiver. Yeah, everybody's going to buy a brand new one. Again, we see the back. I see the back of that little. Uh, Tigertronic signal link USB interface. Oh boy, here you go. Answer D is spelled correctly, DE9. I know, I know, we usually call it DB9, but for this examination, go with the technically correct term DE9. I'm so familiar with DB9 connectors. So if you have an older laptop that you want to tie to your new ham radio to decode data, the computer may only offer a DE9 serial data port connector. So just remember, for this test, the DE9 connector is the correct answer, not the DB9. <clears throat> Okay, let's look for the correct answer by identifying the use of each possible answer. A PL259, a Type N, or a BNC connector is used to join the antenna to your radio. The RCA phono jack is the common connector for an audio connection, just as it is always for as as it always was for connections on your stereo system. So there's your RCA uh, male and female connectors. There's a little picture of it there. Let's see, what page was that on? Do, 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 do.
I need to kind of keep up with this a little bit in the book. Uh, G6B14. What page is that? Oh, there we are. 71. Yep. <clears throat> So the next question has to do with DIN type connectors. And they're found uh, having up to eight or more pins with receptacles located on the back of your HF transceiver. Uh, that happens to be the kind of connection I have to my little USB connection. Of course, you know, they have uh, on the on the um, on the Tigertronics, uh, it is a um, an RS45 telephone type connector or data jack type connector, basically. Uh, and it is an 8-pin DIN type. And you'll see the picture there on page 71 in your book of what a DIN connector typically looks like. So, But each manufacturer has a unique arrangement of what is fed to each pin for audio, power, and control signals. That's why it's important that when you order your signal link, if you should get one, to make sure that you order the correct cable, if you're not gonna build your own, order the correct cable for the radio you're going to be using. Now, I, I could use my uh, Kenwood 940, but I'd need to order a cable for the Kenwood 940 in order to run the digital mode um, on that. But right now it's on the 706. <clears throat> There's your DIN connector. All right. And in case you didn't see that, there it is again. All right. Hooking up your high frequency ham transceiver to your computer opens up a whole new world for receiving and sending data signals. All right. And receiving is almost a direct connection to your computer. We're going to run a little over tonight, maybe. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, we'll see how it goes. If we can get through this pretty quick. There's a lot to cover here. So sending data using on and off handshake modes like PACTOR 2 or GTOR cycles your new general class transceiver to transmit and receive for a duty cycle on transmit of perhaps 50%. But other modes like PSK31 and MFSK16 are transmitting a constant key down data stream without interruption. Doggone it. Come on now. All right. I keep hitting that little mouse roller. So your duty cycle at this point is 100%, and the heat sinks on the back of your transceiver are going to get quite warm. So to keep your equipment from going into meltdown while transmitting in data modes, consider, consider adding an external fan and reducing power output to the point the rear heat sinks won't fry eggs. If you get the heat sinks so warm that you can't touch them, you could damage the transmitter final output stage, and that will lead to a mighty expensive repair. Now remember, it's not really likely that you're going to be transmitting all that long, because what you're gonna do is you're going to type your message and then you're gonna hit send, and it's gonna key up your transmitter, and it's gonna send that message out, but it is, at 100% at that point, and then when it's done, you're gonna go back into receive mode. I don't know anybody that's going to actually, you know, transmit any type of data 100% all the time. Um, but it is something to consider and to keep in mind that uh, when you are transmitting, uh, it's not an on and off situation um, unless you're gonna transmit and then receive. <clears throat> Uh, WinLink is a popular gateway technology linking amateur radio and the internet. Direct radio frequency communications between WinLink stations are also possible, but most of the traffic is between a remote HF station and the internet via a remote messaging station. I don't know of anyone around here that's actually using WinLink, but I'm sure there are some. I'm trying to find that question. If you look on page 76 of your book, 
It gives you a list of digital accessories. Do, do, do. Man, I'm trying to find. The question you're looking for is on page 72. Oh, I'm, I've jumped way ahead here. <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> I'll be honest, wow. you had not lost you when we were going early. I was like, where is this stuff coming from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, well, it talks about which communication system sometimes uses the Internet to transfer, transmit, uh, transfer messages. And the answer there is WinLink or uh, A, basically. We'll get into that, of course, in the answer Q&A session here in just a minute. All right, we're talking about uh, ways to establish contact with a digital messaging system gateway station. It's an interface between different communication systems, such as between the internet and amateur radio. WinLink is one of the most popular gateway technologies, combining email and uh, normally HF radio. Gateway HF stations operate on specific published frequencies, and the way to access one of these gateways for, from a remote HF station is by transmitting a connect command via your WinLink client software. So once you're connected, the HF link is transparent from your terminal. It looks just like you're on an internet email client. There is an Elmer point on that page there at the bottom uh, to, uh, to take a look at. All right, going on to the next, we're almost done here with this. We'll get into the Q&A. Um, so joining a contact between two stations using the PACTOR protocol. PACTOR and a number of other modes operate in a connected mode. In this mode, there's a handshaking or acknowledgement uh, that performs an error correction in an extremely reli reliable manner. So the downside to this is that the connected mode only works between two stations. And this is why PACTOR is very effective for automatic relaying, but it's not really suitable for real-time rag chewing. And there are a number of other digital modes that are suitable to roundtables and general conversation. And we'll learn about those at some point as well. All right. Uh, moving right along here, um, this talks about how can a PACTOR modem or controller be used to determine if the channel is in use by other PACTOR stations. And a rogue PACTOR station can create untold havoc on the HF bands, not to mention a great deal of ill, a great deal of Ill will among other users. Means must be implemented, implemented either automatically or manually to determine if a frequency is in use before transmitting. So the unconnected or monitor mode of a PACTOR controller allows a control uh, operator to do this. So you always want to determine that the frequency is clear before transmitting. And that's going to be in monitor mode for PACTOR. All right, this is dealing with the symptoms that may result from signals interfering uh, with a PACTOR or Winmore transmission. And uh, most of your HF digital modes are robust, and they do usually include some kind of error correction. And there's no perfect system, however. So the quirks of HF propagation itself present a challenge to most digital modes. If the propagation isn't right, uh, you could uh, be experiencing lag times when uh, the digital mode you're using is asking to uh, retry or resend or some, some other signal to receive the entire message and do error correction. Um, and it, it's true there, it's sometimes amazing HF Digi works at all when you have propagation issues. Uh, but an HF link undergoing interference can suffer symptoms ranging from long pauses and message transmissions, frequent message retries and timeouts to complete connection failures. But the digital, di, 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 yeah, di, 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 digital technology is pretty amazing and it's still subject to the laws of physics. 
Okay. Uh, the Pack Tour 3, it's a fast transmission mode as far as HF digital modes go. And it uh, uh, occupies approximately 2300 hertz uh, of bandwidth or 2.300 uh, kilohertz, uh, which is about the same bandwidth as a typical single, single sideband phone, phone signal and can be effectively transmitted through standard amateur HF single sideband equipment, even at its fastest rate. So PacTor 3 doesn't always transmit at maximum speed. And a, a sophisticated adapt, adaptive protocol adjusts the speed depending on propagation conditions at the time. And sometimes it's good to know when to quit. Even if you're an automatic relay station, PacTor and Winmore, both common protocols for the Winlink service, will make numerous attempts to establish or maintain an HF link. But alas, if conditions aren't there, um, it, it's just going to drop the connection but it is still rather robust even under the most horrendous conditions and uh, but when it can't do any more they will deliberately drop the connection after a predetermined number of retries okay that was six so now we're going to talk about a little bit of a knack response pack tour uh it leads to a near perfect reception of a message. The transmitted message is sent in short bursts, allowing the receiving station to quickly transmit ACK for perfect copy or NAC, meaning send it again. I missed a few characters. So this back and forth between uh, the PACTOR station, uh, stations lead to error-free copy with the ACK-NAC exchange. Then you have forward correction, uh, which is abbreviated FEC, and it's achieved by sending each character twice. This allows the receiver to correct errors by double checking the received data. Uh, the data mode AMTOR B, amateur teleprint printing over radio, uses uh, such a mode as FE FE FEC, forward error con correction. I'm really getting tongue tied here at the end here. But uh, let's go on to ARQ. ARQ stands for Automatic Repeat Request. Don't confuse it with Q signals or anything else. Uh, it's an automatic repeat request. Your packet TNC will automatically request that the sending station retransmit the packet if it detects errors in the reception of the data. So moving on to the next question, the uh, HF transceiver with a direct digital synthesizer may allow you to dial in a frequency all the way down to one hertz. If you plan to do digital work on the air, that one hertz tuning and the frequency stability uh, delivered by the DDS will appreci be appreciated by other operators. Now, let me kind of clarify this. We're not going all the way down in frequency to one hertz. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about uh, the, the tuning or the dialing ability and how fine that tuning is on your dial. So most of your modern transceivers, you can either skip at 5 uh, hertz or 5 kilohertz or 10 kilohertz or whatever. You can skip through a band at whatever... Uh, pace you set your HF uh, dialing capability to. In this case, you can go down in some instances to one hertz, and that's really, really fine tuning. And it also depends on the stability. The frequency stability of your radio, too, uh, is uh, very important. So but the DDS circuitry keeps your signal stable on a frequency, making reception of the digital signal much more reliable. Okay. So uh, this, I believe, is the last uh, question that we're going to talk about, uh, the term software-defined radio. So that seems to be the up-and-coming thing these days. 
and uh, you might go over to somebody's house if you don't already have one, and you see the computer connected to a little tiny box sized, uh, book sized box that contains the innards of an actual ham radio, but the rest of the uh, rig is actually in the computer. It is a um, software defined radio in which you use your computer to do all the functions of the radio and uh, it does most of the major signal processing using software and the little box itself contains the output transistors and a cooling fan and together you get the great software defined radio or sdr output of your on your favorite band and it's a good way to keep your rig up to date just download any modifications and presto your rig is like brand new now, ICOM has come out with the 7300, which is a software-defined radio, but the 7300 is very is kind of unique in that it still contains the tactile uh, ability of a regular radio. Yeah, it hooks up to your computer, you do the programming, you set it up, you do all that stuff and everything. But once you do that, you can actually disconnect the computer and you can actually tune it and select different features right on the front of the radio. Uh, what you see here is uh, the hybrid Tentec Jupiter at the bottom left, and it can be operated the vintage way using its front panel knobs, much like the 7300. Uh, but it's totally modern virtual way means of SDR software. As a matter of fact, the Tentec Jupiter uh, kind of uh, preceded, I think, the 7300. Not real sure on that. So you have the laptop on the right-hand side. You have that picture in your book, by the way, on page 75. And it shows you all the different features that you can control the radio, or you can use the tactile feel, uh, feel of... Uh, of a real radio, much like the one on top. All right, we're running short on time here, so let's go through the questions. Is everybody okay? You ready to go with the questions? Let's get to it here. So what segment of the 20 meter band is most often used for data transmission? Again, I kind of mentioned this at the very beginning and you want to tune into 14.070 to 14.100 megahertz. The answer is B. What segment of the 80 meter band is most commonly used for digital transmissions? So uh, again, that's part of the uh, lower end of the 80 meter band. And again, we were talking about, you don't go all the way to the bottom, but it starts from 35, 70. Most of them start at 70 and go up, um, you know, 30, uh, uh, 30 kilohertz. So 35, 70 to 3,600 is the same amount of space that is occupied for digital communications as the 14.070 to 14.1. So which of the following describes BODOC, uh, BODOC code? Uh, again, this is that, remember the high five thing that uh, they talked about in the book. It is a five bit code with an additional start and stop bits. So, uh, basically, it's a seven-bit code, but it's a five-bit code. It just has a start bit and a stop bit, bit at the front and back. So what is the most common frequency shift for RTTY emissions in the amateur HF bands? Uh, that's uh, RIDI emissions. Remember, we talked about that. It has a little bit of a frequency shift of 170 hertz. B is your answer on that. So how are the two separate frequencies of a frequency shift keyed or FSK signal identified? Uh, this goes back to our little mark in space. Uh, D is your correct answer with that. It's not a dot and dash. It's not an on and off. It's not high and low. It's mark in space for FSK. So which mode is normally used when sending RIDI signal via AFSK with a single sideband transmitter? RIDI appears to be the only exception to the rule of USB, but lower sideband is uh, 
the single sideband trans uh, transmitter transmission you want to use. Okay, what could be wrong if you cannot decode a RIDI signal or other FSK signal, even though it is apparently tuned in properly? Um, you remember it has mark and space frequencies. They may be reversed. Uh, you may have selected the wrong baud rate. And you may be listening on the wrong sideband. So really, all these choices are correct. So you can try to change any one of those to make sure to see if it helps you receive the RIDI signal. Which of the following digital modes is designed to operate at extremely low signal strength on the HF bands? Uh, this uh, goes back to that uh, JT uh, uh, yeah, the JT modes that uh, were invented. Oh, gone it. There we go. JT9 and JT65. Um, they use uh, extremely low signal strength, and uh, they were really designed for moon bounce and extremely low frequencies. What is the standard sideband used to generate a JT65 or JT9 digital signal when using AFSK on the amateur band? USB, upper sideband. RIDI is the only exception, apparently, in this case, using lower sideband. In what segment of the 20-meter band are most PSK31 operations commonly found? Uh, again, that's the 20-meter um, the band is the uh, 14 uh, megahertz. You want to be below the RIDI segment near 14.070 megahertz. Remember that frequency. So how many data bits are sent in a single PSK31 character? How many data bits? Remember, it's kind of part of that varicode stuff. So actually the number varies, answer is A. Which of the following statements is true about PSK31? Um, remember that RIDI uses uppercase, um, and uppercase letters use longer varicode signals and thus slow down transmissions. And that would be a true statement for PSK31. And that's why PSK31 uses, use, usually you're transmitting in lowercase. So keep in mind that the very code signals, uh, the uppercase letters are longer and they slow down transmissions. <clears throat> uh, what is indicated on a waterfall display by one or more vertical lines adjacent to a P PSK 31 signal? Um, if you have uh, adjacent vertical lines on a PSK31 signal, it generally means you have, you're overmodulating, you're driving it too far or too hot. So you wanna redu reduce your modulation, reduce your power to about 25 to 50%. Which of the following describes a waterfall display? Um, remember, if you kind of remember what the waterfall display looks like, uh, you know that across there, across the line, there's a, a horizontal line which shows the frequency. Um, then you also have the signal strength uh, as far as intensity, and that's usually done by the color that you see on the waterfall display, and the time is vertical. And so as that signal is received, that waterfall display scrolls up. What does the number 31 represent in PSK 31? <laughs> it's not C. <laughs> um, and it's not D either. And it's not necessarily the version of the PSK protocol. But it is the approximate transmitted symbol rate of the signal. Which type of code is used for sending characters in a PSK31 signal? 
Again, that varies, so we want to we we know that it's going to be a very code. A is the answer. How is an FSK signal generated? And um, the FSK again, we're talking about frequency shift keying, um, but it's done within the oscillator and your frequency you change your oscillators frequency directly with a digital control signal so that's how your fsk signal is generated by changing your oscillators frequency directly with a digital control signal i gotta turn down the radio That's a little loud, I think. It's probably coming through. Okay, what is the relationship between transmitted symbol rate and bandwidth? Uh, think a little bit about this because um, the symbol rate, A, is not the correct answer uh, as being not related. Uh, C is not the answer as lower symbol rates require bandwidth because they don't. Uh, D is not the correct answer. Bandwidth is always half the symbol rate. That's not correct. Uh, B is your correct answer. The higher symbol rates require wider bandwidth. The higher symbol rates. And that's why you're limited on the HF bands versus being on the VHF and the higher bands. Or 10 meters and up, basically. So what is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RIDI or data emission transmitted at frequencies below 28 megahertz? Very simple. Your uh, answer is D is 300 baud. You can't really approach anything higher um, until you get to uh, 10 meters. And so the same answer applies to the maximum symbol rate permitted for RIDI or data emission transmissions on the 20 meter band again that's 300 baud so what is the maximum symbol rate permitted for ready or data transmissions on the 10 meter band again we can kind of jump up our speed and we can go four times that to 1200 baud at 10 meters to use a higher rate of course um, we need to go to uh, a higher frequency band so what is the maximum symbol rate on the two meter band? Here we can use 19.6 kilobaud. Answer is B. Um, what is the maximum symbol rate when you go higher than two meters and say you're on the one and a quarter meter band, which is the 222 band or 70 centimeter, which is the 440 megahertz band. In this case, again, the higher you go, the higher the baud rate. A is your answer, 56 kilobaud. What part of a data packet contains the routing and handling information? Think about this because it's not the directory or the preamble or the footer. It's always the header information that contains the routing and handling information of a data packet. What's contained in the header? So which of the following is the FCC term for an unattended digital station that transfers message to and from the internet? This is all about, you know, it's unattended, so automatically you should think that it's automatically controlled digital station. That's what the FCC calls it. On what bands may automatically controlled stations transmit RIDI or data emissions communicate with other automatically controlled digital stations? On what bands can this be done? And very specific about this, but it's not on any band segment and it's not anywhere in the non-phone segments and it's not on non-phone extra class segment bands. It's going to be D is your answer anywhere in the one and a quarter meter or shorter wavelength bands and in specified segments of the 80 meter through two meter bands. So what is required to conduct communications with a digital station or operating under 
let's see, what is required to conduct communications with a digital station operating under automatic control outside the automatic control band segments? Um, there is a requirement here. And when you look at these answers, the only answer that really applies is A, the station initiating the contact must be under local or remote control. Under what circumstances are messages that are sent via digital modes exempt from Part 97 third-party rules that apply to other modes of communication? <laughs> uh, think very hard about this, and it shouldn't be too difficult to answer. Um, in reality, there are no digital modes that are exempt from Part, 30, uh, part 97. So under no circumstances, your answer is A. What two devices in an amateur radio station might be connected to uh, might be connected using a USB interface? Okay, what two devices? Uh, remember, I showed you that little signal link, and it goes right between your computer and your transceiver. A is your correct answer there. Which of the following connectors would be a good choice for a serial data port? You have several to choose from there, but remember it's that little DB9 or DE9 in this case. The DE9 connector is the choice for a serial port connection. PL259 type N and type SMA are all RF antenna type connections. Which of these connector types is commonly used for audio signals in amateur radio stations? That little tiny RCA phono plug, C is your correct answer. PL250, PL259, BNC, and type N, again, are antenna type connectors. They're not for audio necessarily. So what is the general description of a DIN type connector? Now remember that's that little round, the DIN is typically that little round and it can have uh, multiple connections to it and little pins in it and everything but it is a family of multiple circuit connectors suitable for audio and control signals. Why is it important to know the duty cycle of the mode you're using when transmitting? Um, again, you wanna, know, you wanna know what the duty cycle of the mode you're using when transmitting. Uh, and it, and it applies specifically to transmitting. So again, some modes have a high duty cycle, which can exceed the transmitter's average power rating. B is your correct answer on this. Which communication system sometimes uses the internet to transfer, uh, transfer uh, messages? Uh, we just got finished talking about that. It's WinLink, and it's something that I don't know many uh, maybe, maybe they use it. I don't know much about WinLink personally, uh, but uh, WinLink is the correct answer A here. So which of the following is a way to establish contact with a digital messaging system gateway station? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, you want to establish contact by transmitting a connect message on the station's published frequency. How do you join a contact between two stations using the PACTOR protocol? How do you join a contact between two stations using PACTOR protocol? I, I'm not sure why they did this. The answer on this is C. I'm looking at these and everything. And joining an existing contact is not possible. Pactor connections are limited to two stations. I think I follow what they're saying here. If you have two stations that are communicating on Pactor, you might be able to listen into it, but you cannot connect to them uh, because Pactor connections are limited to two stations. 
So you cannot connect a third station. You won't be able to join in with them. Same thing if you're connected on Pactor with another person, nobody is going to be able to connect in on your uh, QSO. It establishes a connection between the two and they stay connected until you drop the connection. So how can a Pactor modem or controller be used to determine if the channel is in use by other Pactor stations? So how can a Pactor modem or controller be used to determine if the channel is in use by other Pactor stations? And what you really need to do is you need to put the modem or controller in a mode which allows monitoring communications without a connection. And again, you won't be able to connect to them. If you're listening into a communication between two Pactor stations, you're not going to be able to connect to them, but you can monitor it. What symptoms may result from other signals interfering with a Pactor or Winmore transmission? Um, when you look at this, you might have frequent retries or timeouts, long pauses in a message transmission, fa failure to establish a connection between two stations. All of these are correct choices. And usually depends on um, your conditions, your uh, atmospheric conditions, propagation at the time too. What is the approximate bandwidth of a PACTOR 3 signal at a maximum data rate? Remember what it said that it was about the same as a single sideband uh, voice signal. And so 23 hertz or 2300 hertz or D is your answer for this. Almost done. We're a little bit over. What action results from a failure to exchange information due to excessive transmission attempts when using Pactor or Winmore? So what action results from a failure? Um, it talked nothing about checksum. Uh, packets uh, are not going to be routed in correctly. It has nothing to do with that. Enco encoding reverts to the default character set. No, the connection is going to be dropped. So when you fail to exchange that information and you encounter problems, B is your answer here. The connection is going to be dropped, plain and simple. In the PACTOR protocol, what is meant by a NAC response to a transmitted packet? Remember, you have the ACNAC. And depending on the ACNAC depends on whether that transmission uh, is going to be transmitted and received properly. So really, the receiver is requesting the packet to be retransmitted. The ACK is an acknowledgement. The NAC is, hey, I, I can't acknowledge. No acknowledgement here. You know, please uh, send it again. So A is your proper answer there. How does forward error correction allow the receiver to correct errors and receive data packets? Uh, this uh, particular mode of uh, communication using FEC uh, is done by transmitting really redundant information. Uh, the characters are sent twice and it's rechecked and everything. So uh, basically the received data packets uh, should be received error-free with the forward error correction of uh, redundant information being sent with the data. How does the receiving station respond to an ARQ data mode packet containing errors? Remember, the ARQ is a request for uh, retransmit. So B is your answer here. It requests the packet to be retransmitted. Which of the following is an advantage of a transceiver controlled by a direct digital synthesizer? Uh, Boy, oh boy, which of the following is an advantage of a transceiver controlled by a direct digital synthesizer? Again, this is uh, you know, part of your software-defined uh, radio, but the variable frequency with the stability of a crystal oscillator. Okay. Some radios have a stability oscillator built in. Other radios, I recall, um, you can get a higher stability by ordering and having as an option 
the crystal uh, oscillator. What is meant by the term software defined radio or SDR? And when you look at that, when you look at all those answers, the only possible or the plausible, the one that makes sense, is a radio in which most major signal processing functions are performed by software. Software defined radio. Plain and simple. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to take care of that, get rid of that. So um, there we are. We are about uh, 16 minutes past the top of the hour. Um, that concludes session three for this evening. And uh, we covered quite a bit there with the two topics of CW and digital communications. And tomorrow night, uh, we'll try to do the same. We don't have as many. Uh, we'll, we'll do two topics tomorrow. Uh, the first topic has 18 slides and the second topic 90. So that should give us more than enough time to function within the two hour time frame that we have allotted. If you have any questions, let me know. And um, you can send me an email at uh, wayne at n3lms.net. Um, I want to stop the broadcast. I'm going to talk to uh, the live people now and see if there's anything that uh, they want to cover as far as a topic.